Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Centre for Social Justice conference and indeed its first event in three days of discussion and debate. I'm very happy to have been asked to chair its opening session today on how we can secure justice for victims of modern slavery. Um, my name is Julie Etchingham, for those who haven't uh, met me before, um, and as well as anchoring News at 10 for ITV, I've been reporting on modern slavery and human trafficking for over 10 years, uh, and most recently on the CSJ's important report on the fifth anniversary of the Modern Slavery Act, five years on. And of course, it's on the basis of the CSJ's original report in 2013 that the government passed that act. And while this groundbreaking legislation set a template for governments around the world to follow, um, in terms of securing justice for victims, there is still a very long way to go yet, as the number of men, women and children caught up in this appalling crime skyrocket. Convictions are still too low. Sentencing those convictions are clearly little deterrent still. So there is a lot to address, uh, not least and above all, for the victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. And our official statistics suggest there could be around 11,000 of them in the UK, but a recent report by the CSJ estimates the number could be 10 uh, times that figure in the UK alone. And of course, it goes without saying for all of you who are engaged in this subject matter, that those who uh, suffer the appalling crime of modern slavery and trafficking suffer brutality that is hard to comprehend. Uh, what I've learned in all the years of reporting on this issue, that there is no feature of a human being <clears throat> that cannot be exploited for criminal profit. They suffer coercion and cruelty, often with no means of escape. And the stories that I've heard from survivors over the years simply never leave you. And it's why I'm passionate about trying to keep this issue on the agenda, on the news agenda, as, as often as I can. And what's become increasingly clear is that proper victim support and care is crucial in keeping them engaged in the pursuit of their persecutors. More and better police training is needed, better engagement of the public through our politicians and the media, better use of technology in dismantling criminal networks. And of course, this cruel backdrop of the pandemic means that solutions couldn't be needed now more urgently as millions around the world are pushed into poverty and desperation through economic collapse. So lots of things to discuss and urgently address in our conversation this morning. Um, and we couldn't have a better panel to get stuck in. Um, we have uh, before us Dame Sarah Thornton, the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner for the UK. Previous to this, she was the Chief Constable of Thames Valley Police in a 33 year career in policing. She was also the first chair of the National Police Chiefs Council. Alongside Dame Sarah is Right Honourable Karen Bradley MP. She's currently chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery. She's a former Minister for Modern Slavery who worked closely with the former PM Theresa May to secure the passing of the Modern Slavery Act. Caroline Hohey QC, a leading criminal barrister who successfully prosecuted the first cases under the Modern Slavery Act and led the first review into it in 2016. She's also successfully prosecuted the largest slavery gang yet on record and will be able to offer us some really crucial insight in the, into the process of uh, prosecution. And uh, last but not least, of course, Christian Guy, uh, CEO of Justice and Care, the global anti-trafficking charity which works alongside the CSJ. Uh, the charity directly supports victims and works hand in hand with police in this work. And uh, I was very privileged to see recently just how uh, effective the, the work that Justice and Care does uh, on this. Um, so before we get going with questions from all of you who've joined the webinar this morning, and you're all very welcome indeed. Uh, we're going to start by asking each of our panelists to offer some opening thoughts for two or three minutes. Um, and then we'll go to questions from all of you. Uh, that's the most important part of the webinar. 
so please do join in. Uh, you can submit questions into the Q&A box in your Zoom screen. Um, I'm sure many of you will be very used to doing this by now. Um, and I will put them to the panel once we've heard from each of them. So in advance, thanks to all of you for joining us, not least our panel, uh, uh, of course, and uh, I'll hand you first of all to Dame Sarah for her opening remarks. Morning. Thank you, Julie, and good morning to you and good morning, everybody. This is a really important issue. As Julie said, um, the number of prosecutions were down last year, and that's despite the fact that the number of police operations were up by about 29% despite the fact that more victims have been identified than ever before. And the first point I'd like to make is that this is actually not an issue that's peculiar to the United Kingdom. Um, speaking to John Richmond, the American ambassador for trafficking in persons, he sees it as a phenomenon right across the world and in the US. And I know both Caroline and I have been speaking to the McCain Institute in Washington, who want to do a bit of work across the globe to see what's going on here more victims but fewer prosecutions and rather than each side blaming each other let's try and work out exactly what's going on to try and put something uh, right the uh, a recent police report suggested that what was needed was um, more dedicated teams and, and more expertise and of course that's right but also i think we need to do some detailed work on what are the barriers is it about uh, difficulty in getting information on data from tech companies it's about difficulty about getting financial information from the banks what is it that's um, causing the problems of course the current backlogs uh, in the crown courts which are in the papers again today are not going to help if trials are being set for 2022 it will be so difficult to keep vulnerable victims engaged in the process and able to give witness evidence so i'm very keen that we look at practical issues but the question um, I was asked was, what should the government do? And I've got three asks for the government. The first is, wouldn't it be great if the Home Secretary made a really high profile speech saying it is so important that we bring these traffickers uh, to justice? Um, really strong political leadership um, kind of creates the environment in which we all, all operate. The second uh, point would be, can we please deal with these backlogs in the courts? I just don't understand how the system can be functioning well for all sorts of really serious cases, but particularly for modern slavery and human trafficking cases. Um, we cannot keep victims warm for two or three years, keep them engaged and keep their confidence in the system. Uh, and my third ask would be that um, earlier this year, um, a former colleague of mine, Sir Craig Mackey, completed a report onto, into the way that we deal with serious and organized crime. Um, now that report has yet to be published and yet to be published with the government's plan. I do think that this is part of a much more general view about just how joined up and how well resourced we are to tackle serious and organised crime. So I would say, please, government, um, publish that report and show some leadership in terms of uh, putting some resources and some energy behind it. The second part of the question was about victim care. And uh, from everything I know about policing, um, it is utterly essential. And we know that often cases collapse because victims um, are not uh, supported or in fact cases don't even get that far they are filed in the police station because victims uh, are not confident and not engaged and we also know conversely where there are systems where victims feel supported like at the key to house like with the victim care navigators actually that makes a huge difference in terms of prosecution so so let's do uh, more more of that but my last kind of passing thought and it was partly because i've been speaking to colleagues in, in the US and I'm just really concerned that we, we ensure that of course um, the, um, victims of modern slavery have suffered the most egregious human rights abuses but also it's really important we don't lose sight of the prosecution and sometimes there's a rather tenuous link between support for victims and prosecution and I think that happens at our peril particularly when if you speak to colleagues in the US um, uh, proposals around defunding the police, defunding law enforcement, and making people say, well, let's give up on prosecution. I absolutely think we mustn't give up on prosecution. Of course, there are huge human rights violations, but these are really serious criminal offences that have been committed, and the offenders need to be brought to justice. Really important topic. Looking forward to the debate. Thank you very, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dame Sarah, for that and uh, those observations. Some important questions for government in particular. Um, so I'll hand you now to Karen Bradley for her opening remarks. 
Thanks so much, Julie. And it's really nice to see you. We were reflecting just before we came on air that uh, we've, we've worked together on so many things over the years. And um, whilst I may have had a, a slight uh, detour into Northern Ireland for a little while, I've never really lost my um, passion for this subject because once I became the Minister for Modern Slavery in the Home Office, it really did feel like like there was an opportunity to grasp something thanks to the work that Christian had led at the CSJ and the work that Caroline was doing in, uh, in, in prosecutions and obviously Dame Sarah and other law enforcement colleagues in terms of uh, the organised criminality but also the individual criminality that goes with this. And I think if I go back to what were we trying to achieve, what was the, the act about? It was of twofold and it links very much to what Dame Sarah's just said. You cannot break the cycle of slavery unless you can A, find the victims and support the victims and prosecute the perpetrators. That is absolutely vital. There's no point just saving a victim because that perpetrator will go on and create another victim. The way to stop there being more victims is to stop the perpetrators and get the prosecutions. And so the act was all about actually an overall strategy. It was a small part of the modern slavery strategy um, about how did we break that cycle? What did we need to do? And so the question I was posed, my exam question was what was good and what do we need to do more of? Um, I think following on from the act, it's great to see the use of uh, the civil orders, the protection orders, they actually are a really helpful way of getting uh, protection for victims because often law enforcement finds it really difficult to take the case to a prosecution. But, but if you can protect the victims using protection orders, the civil orders, you've got another tool there, you've got another weapon that you can use. And so that's, that's been really good and you know, all reports are that they, they work well there are some things that could be improved, but they're working well. Um, we have seen some really successful high profile cases and we'll come on, Caroline can talk about those far more than I can, but uh, that's really, uh, it, it makes it feel that all the days of debate we had about how we worded those offences, that actually we got some of it, we got it right because we're enabling people like Caroline to bring successful prosecutions. Um, I'm also pleased to see that there's been movement on the support for children and particularly on the independent child trafficking advocates or guardians. When I was the minister, we were piloting those. And, you know, there was a real fear in government they were going to be hideously expensive and were they going to be actually effective. I think they've proven that they can be both, uh, that they are incredibly effective and that children do need that specialist in support. And then the final bit I would just highlight from the Act was the Transparency and Supply Chain Measure, Section 54, which... Um, was something that was really difficult to get through government. I'm not going to pretend that that was an easy thing, but actually that, that has the potential to really open this up because it makes everybody have to be aware of this at board level on companies and really responsive to it. And that takes me to what could be done better. So more use of the offences, that's about education, that's about law enforcement, understanding the offences, understanding that they're there. I well understand that if you've got a case and you can bring a, a well-established offence like a rape charge or something like that, that might feel like an easier option. You get the same sentence and you get a, a successful conviction. But actually, if we don't use these offences, then the risk protection orders are harder to, to, to put, bring into force. And we're not showing that, that actually these are slavery offences. You know, we, we still talk about the statistics. Um, I think the NRM, we, none of us are going to say anything other than the NRM needs serious reform. It has done since uh, before I was the minister. We worked on reforming it, but it really does need, now need to be reformed. Um, there is more that can be done with the transparency and supply chain measures. I would say that they need beefing up. Pleased to see the statement from the Home Office a couple of weeks ago, but more needs to be done. And I think victim support you know, you're talking about the most vulnerable people. They don't want to admit to being a slave. Nobody would. And so we've got to make sure that support works. And then my final point is just the pandemic, COVID. Where are the victims? What's happening to the victims? The places that we know victims used to be are not open. They're not able to work in these places. So therefore, where are they? And what is happening? How are they being exploited? There's a big piece of work to be done on that. 
Um, um, thank you for that. I will hand over to others now and look forward to the questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Car uh, uh, Karen, for that. So I'm going to hand straight to Caroline Hawley because as you'll see, she is uh, raring to go into court. We only have a short amount of time with you, sadly, Caroline, but I'll hand to you for your observations. Uh, thank you, Julia. Um, really, everything that's been said by Dame Sarah and by Karen is the platform for where we are now in prosecutions. Dealing firstly with collaboration, trafficking deals with the movement of people. Yes, a lot of it is domestic, but a lot of it's international. And we are really struggling in obtaining material. One of the things uh, Dame Sarah mentioned was our work with the McCain uh, Institute. And we are really pushing to put together a foundation of prosecutors, people like myself who are, well, immersed in this world, seeing how we can learn from our mistakes. How can we make it better? How can I um, deploy my contacts in all the other jurisdictions that are facing the same challenges that we are? Information, um, rightly picked up again uh, by Dame Sarah. Banking information, follow the money. Trafficking and exploitation are founded on greed. That is what drives all of this. It is the use of human beings for someone else's predominantly financial gain. It may not be money in their pocket, but it may be money that they don't have to spend if you're looking at domestic servitude, or money that others are spending for sex, or appalling labour conditions that go far beyond bad employment, falling re really into the remit of criminal employment. Witness engagement. I cannot, but well, I can prosecute cases without witnesses, but it's hard. Witnesses need to be able to tell their story because when you allow someone who has been the victim of exploitation and trafficking an opportunity to reclaim what has happened to them, you give them an opportunity to own that and to reclaim some of their dignity. Every witness we called in Operation Fort, and there were 60 of them, of an approximate 350 identified victims, felt better, every one of them. When we did the second trial, every one of them was very content to re-engage. The process itself is not hard. But looking after them, maintaining their engagement with the process is the hardest part. And it's our responsibility to enable them to recover that which has been taken from them. And actually, juries want to hear. They want to hear what's happened from those who have been affected by it. Education of prosecutors is vital. As uh, Karen rightly pointed out, we are not prosecuting these cases effectively. We are not deploying the right legislation in the right places and people are scared of it. There is no reason for that. I accept and acknowledge that they can be complex and voluminous. But the joy of modern slavery and human trafficking offences, if you are an investigator, is that it uses all your skills as an investigator. It's not like murder. You don't pick up the handbook and start dead body, work backwards. Who did it? Why did they do it? Where did they do it? When did they do it? With modern slavery and human trafficking, you take the sphere of the offence and you start picking it apart financially from the complainant's perspective, looking at other records, and you paint a picture that becomes the jigsaw in which you put the pieces. Um, a point that was raised that, by Karen that I absolutely endorse. Yes, we have a priority to safeguard. That is vital. That's what drives this. But disruption leading to prevention and stopping of this offending is vital. Modern slavery and human trafficking can be the core offence or it can be a subsidiary offence that occurs for people who are laundering money for terrorism. Human beings are a product. That is how traffickers view them and exploiters view them. And they are akin to guns and drugs, save for one thing when you're dealing with human beings. They are multi-purpose and therefore far more valuable and far more rewarding. It is our responsibility as our fellow man to ensure that we stop this happening. And I'd like to finally deal with this. Section 54, answer transparency and supply chains. What the pandemic has taught us, if anything, is that we need to know what we're buying, where it comes from, and at what cost. Not just environmental, but the human cost. I think what we read is happening in Leicester speaks volumes about that. When does that bad employment become criminal employment? How do we identify the victims? How do people who have no other option who have made <laughs> consent because there is no other option and who do this because they have no choice and they can't change their circumstances. How do we assess that? There is now, I am of the view, a time and a place to identify those who are failing 
in their supply chain compliance. It's all well and good paying lip service and putting the statement up. Let's actually do something about those who pay lip service and don't act because this is our platform to do so. And my observations of society as it's uh, morphed during uh, the pandemic is that they too are engaged with that. Those are my words and thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Caroline. I'm sure you'll stay with us until you have to dash out into your courtroom. Thank you uh, very much. And I'll hand uh, straight over to Christian Guy uh, from Justice and Care for his observations and what you've learned in the support of uh, victims and survivors, Christian. Julie, thanks uh, so much uh, for that. And um, just four quick points from, from me this morning, based on some of that casework we've got uh, running in, in the UK and Europe and in Asia. The first point really is a point, I think, for charities like mine, to be honest, and that is that we've got to recognise that fighting slavery isn't just about care and support. It starts with that. But I'm often surprised by how many of us feel glad in charities when we've applied a sticking plaster. And um, I'm really proud to be providing sticking plasters. But if we stop there, um, it's not enough. And we shouldn't just settle for that. That pursuit of justice and helping people to get justice is often um, what, what they want. So we can't just put our arms around people, as has been said, and hope that the abuse stops. It's not enough to settle for just some, some low level arrests. So we've got to focus on helping police and law enforcement, which we are not as charities and never should attempt to be, but help them to uh, dismantle that business model that has been touched on by what the panelists have said so far. So the first point is to pursue that justice and not just, not just the care. The second sort of suggestion is that we've got to start finding more of the people that are out there. You know, only one in 10 at best, we think, are being found. And that was based on some police data we published at Justice and Care with the, with the CSJ. Um, now, I don't think we need to spend any more time debating whether it's 80,000, 100,000 or more. The point is that it isn't a 10 to 13,000 person problem that the Home Office still says it is. Now, um, that matters because in government, scale matters. And so, the difference in response between uh, a government that thinks this is a 10,000 person problem or a 100, 150,000 person problem is significant. And, and we've got to therefore start finding more of the people that are out there if we've got any hope of trying to fight this properly. Now, how we find them is a different conversation. Maybe we come back to that. Third observation is that we've got to put victim care at the heart of the law enforcement response. Not that law enforcement should be doing the victim care, I'll come on to that. But how we treat victims, as has been said already so um, articulately, how we treat victims determines, we find, whether we have a decent shot at bringing their traffickers to justice or not. And I think governments and police, uh, to be honest, often slip into that habit of seeing victim care as a bit of a luxury item, like a Tesco finest or a, an add-on. But that is a major error because in our experience, if victims don't feel trust if they don't have that wraparound support if they don't feel helped or that they even matter and a lot of them right now feel that they don't matter in this country they will not talk they'll walk they'll run and we lose so much of the information they would be willing to share if that happens and that is what's happening all over the country at the moment mass disengagement by victims from police activity despite a lot of good police officers out there trying to do their best um, but we know survivors want justice and if we help them, if we care for them, and if we put them at the heart of the strategy, I do believe our prosecution rates will skyrocket um, very, very fast. So victim care needs to move from being a political inconvenience or an afterthought to absolutely core business if we've got any hope of bringing trafficking networks down. I know that's been said already, but it's our experience at Justice and Care. And the fourth and final point, is that we've got to unleash the power of nonprofits in the fight at law enforcement level. And I'm talking about genuine partnership, not NGOs trying to become law enforcement. Heaven forbid, that would be a total disaster and mistake. But for all the faults of my sector and for organizations like Justice and Care, and there are many faults with us, we do bring something special as organizations. And I do think government and police need to unleash more of it. And you know, one of the programs we're, we're learning from, which has been mentioned, is the Navigator program. There are lots of brilliant NGOs out there, some of them on this call. So this is not a plug for us, but I'm just saying we're learning something useful because we've got uh, victim specialists that we employ embedded in police investigation teams, working independently, but shoulder to shoulder. 
And the police focus on doing their job, investigating organized crime, and we coordinate the victim care with other brilliant partners in the NRM and elsewhere. And sometimes that means buying a sandwich, booking a hotel, taking to the GP. And at other times it means legal advice, specialist counseling, whatever they need. And this is what the police don't have time to do or the capability to do actually, and what victims want us to do and not the police to do. Just one day, piece of data that's coming through from that program, the Navigator program, 83% of the victims in our cases are choosing to talk, to share evidence, give intelligence to police teams through our navigators. We think that compares to about 30% nationally. So it's pushing boundaries. It's not always easy. Uh, we're breaking through some old thinking, but it's what we now need because the same approaches will deliver the, the same results. And I think between police and NGOs, it's time for real innovation. So. I don't care who delivers that, what we call it, which charities are involved, but I think there's something in that model of shoulder to shoulder partnership in police investigations where NGOs manage the victim care and police investigate the crime, but really close together and embedded. I think that needs to go all over the country. And I believe if it does, we'll see real results. So just four points from me, I hope that helps. Um, uh, the final thing I would say is we've got to be optimistic. You know, We see speeches like yesterday's from Priti Patel where there's some hope and at the same time she's grouping together traffickers and do-gooders and it's, it's really time for us to, to stand up and say victim care counts, these people matter and if you put them first you will see justice done. Okay Christian and all four of you thank you very much indeed and uh, just whilst I was listening to all of your uh, very interesting opening remarks I was keeping an eye on our Q&A uh, box and um, if you'll forgive me I'm going to go to one very quickly so I can put it to Caroline. Um, before she dashes into court, because this is specifically about uh, training uh, for, for lawyers. Uh, this question from Craig Barlow. Um, you recommended the training for law enforcement and judiciary uh, in 2016, uh, Caroline, in your first assessment of the Modern Slavery Act. In 2019, the independent review of the Act made the same recommendation, and yet practice and knowledge throughout the country is still patchy. Why has that not been secured, do you think? I mean, from a, from a layperson's point of view, it, would feel, it feels like sort of base camp to make sure that the legal profession know how to use the Act and to prosecute cases. Julia, I couldn't agree more. And uh, Craig, who I have in fact used professionally as an expert in section uh, 45 defences, knows exactly where I'm coming from. Um, we have offered, we have tried. Uh, I have liaised very closely um, with Sean Sawyer, uh, who is the chief constable who leads in, um, he's Devon and Cornwall, but he leads for this with chief of police. And there is, for reasons I don't really understand, a resistance both by the prosecution and by defence lawyers to understand their responsibilities, not just to have effective prosecutions, but to ensure that those they are representing aren't the victims of trafficking, and I'm talking about defence solicitors, to make sure that they're not the victims of trafficking themselves. There seems to be this um, resistance to understanding how people can end up where they do within an organized crime group and can be compelled to conduct criminal matters uh, and acts as a result of pressure put on them by others and why this resistance exists i don't know training has been offered for free um i think part of it is time part of it is denial <laughs> and part of it is a bigger picture if we stop prosecuting this and start lancing the boil, dare I say it, the pus is just going to keep coming and where do we stop it? But my view as an independent practitioner who prosecutes and defends is if you don't glance the boil and drain it, you're never gonna cure it. Treating the symptoms, and to use Christian's analogy, is not going to deal with the problem. We need to stand up, proactively engage with the issue, look out exactly as Christian says, for our victims, keep them engaged with the process, educate ourselves on how we can do this, and stop being scared of confronting it head on. Opford was the first ever prosecution for West Midlands Police. It's the biggest prosecution in Europe for modern slavery and trafficking. And every single person who was charged has been convicted. I think that says it all. And that was the work of a police team who'd never done it before. Okay, Caroline, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, I know you, we might have you for literally about a minute longer, but uh, we're really grateful. And, and um, forgive me for going straight in on something so, uh, pretty specific. Um, I'm just going to come to another question now, because I think this will allow us to get to, to a, a wider range of territory. Rianne uh, Heesman, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, has just asked a very simple question. What do you think the role of the public is 
in combating modern slavery. Um, a, a Christian, uh, in the, the CSJ report recently, um, the public's understanding of uh, modern slavery and human trafficking and what it might look like in their local community has clearly risen in the last few years. But how crucial are the public in being your eyes and ears, particularly when it, it comes to identifying those who may be victims? Absolutely vital. There has been real progress, which we should celebrate. We're seeing it much more, um, seeing much greater awareness. But I think the police, and obviously Dame Sarah will know as well, the police rely on so many reports. Um, in some of our cases, we're finding that it's the public that generate the first uh, concern. They see something like a minibus of people being dropped off at the same time every day, not looking well, or they go to the car wash, or there's a house on their street. We've got one about 100 yards away from where we live, which we're pretty sure we've just reported maybe a brothel. So it's about that old spirit of neighborhood watch to want of a better sort of less cheesy concept but it is that it is so important that we have people who are aware eyes and ears not to great some great paranoia but because the police rely on it and i think some of the biggest successes come because maybe frontline practitioners or charities or members of the public spot something that just in their gut doesn't feel right and that will trigger it um, in, in my view i think it's crucial um, thank you for that. Karen, could I come to you on this? Because a lot of people uh, look at the issue of modern slavery and see it so closely associated with the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, who gave it a profile um, uh, that, it, that it simply had never had before. You know, and that's a, a lot is down to the work of the team at the Home Office uh, that were working on it with her too, of course. But isn't there a fundamental issue with this, is that you don't have a clear political figurehead constantly banging the drum on this and I'm, that's not to undermine the work that you and many others do on this but isn't there something really missing here and that is somebody who is owning this in parliament yeah well i think julie you know having that leadership political leadership and and dame sarah made the point about big speeches and set piece events which sometimes when you're a minister feels slightly run of the mill but to the to the outside world is a really big event and they're really important. And I think, you know, what Christian said about yesterday's speech from the Home Secretary, there were some green shoots there. There were some things that we all went, this, this could be good. We've got to latch onto those good bits, but we need to make sure that, uh, that there's the recognition about victims and how victims should be supported. And as Christian said, you know, there isn't a conflation between do-gooders and perpetrators, for goodness sake, that you know, actually, you know, and, and, and there isn't actually, there shouldn't be a conflation between migration and legal migration and victims. People who are being trafficked are victims. Do you think and the public really understand the distinction between the two? Oh, well, that was the point I was coming on to, that I think that's where there is a difficulty. There's the language that's used around this. And there's a real role here for the press. And you, Julia, are a great advocate, and you really do make sure this is kept at the top of the news agenda. But you're not, you know, you're, you're a one of many, many. And we're not seeing that language coming through in the newspapers. We're not seeing that language coming through. I mean, I did a, uh, an interview around the Leicester incidents. Uh, on uh, on a major broadcaster and the first question I got was what is modern slavery now that might be a nice opening line for the interviewer but I didn't want to be asked what is modern slavery I wanted to be in a position we all knew what modern slavery was and we were talking a lot further down the line so I think there's a real role for the press here as well and getting that language right Okay, thank you. Dame Sarah, now I know that you and I discussed before, you know, maybe it's time to kite mark products in shops um, just to get people to engage with modern slavery and trafficking in the way that we know um, people engage, for example, in environmental issues. What is the role of the public in securing uh, justice for victims of modern slavery in your view? So as well as speaking out in the way that Christian talked about and even speaking out when you see a, maybe a co-worker who you know is poorly dressed, seems very kind of quiet, uh, stressed, just to say something. Because some of the um, victims in the case that Caroline was talking about, Operation Four, you know, after the event, their co-workers said, "Well, we always thought Jack, or whatever, you know, didn't seem quite right. Uh, didn't you know? Didn't seem very happy in his work or in himself." Um, so looking out for co-workers. But the big point I think is that what we can all do as consumers. So I think you know. If we knew sometimes um, in maybe the, the goods we buy or the services we buy, you know, that exploitation was really, you know, quite uh, involved in, in those uh, su the supply of goods or services, 
uh, and really is much closer to us than we would feel comfortable with, I think we might think twice. I think, you know, the point that was made about the Leicester issue is beginning to kind of raise awareness. Um, but I, I, I do think we can all ask questions. Uh, and if something is priced in a way which is too good to be true, you know, maybe that's because it's based on the exploitation uh, of a fellow human being. So I think we all uh, can do something as consumers. In terms of kite marks, it's really difficult for, you know, you know, there are debates whether kind of slave free um, uh, marks would be, be helpful and whether you can ever be super, super confident. So I think that's a kind of difficult territory. But I do think we need to make it easier uh, for consumers. But, but to go back to the Leicester point, which I think is really, really interesting. Some of you might have read Alison Levitt's report, uh, which was published 10 days ago. And Alison was, was paid, uh, leading QC, paid by Boohoo. And, and she lists in that report all that was happening in the subcontractors in terms of, you know, wage theft, health and safety issues, no holiday pay, no sick pay, no contracts, real risk of fire, huge amount of uh, issues, which were probably what we'd call labor abuses. They're not really modern slavery. And she also says, um, in fact, there's no evidence that Boohoo committed any criminal offenses. And I, you know, let's test that, but I suspect with the law as it currently stands, she's probably right. And so the question for all of us is, do we think it's okay for a leading brand, a, a retailer, to source from all those subcontractors and sort of blame the subcontractors um, when in fact probably the retailers create a lot of the environment, they create the market in which that happens. So I think there's a really big policy question now about um, Section 54 of the um, Modern Slavery Act, the Transparency Supply Chains, <clears throat> puts an onus on companies to look for modern slavery in their supply chains. And I think the big question is, should it be changed to say, well, they should really also be looking for human rights abuses. Uh, and you could start <laughs> off by saying, you know, put an obligation on them to look out for human rights abuses. And then if they don't do that, think about what the sanction could be further down the path. But I think it's raised a really, really important question about does our legislation go far enough? If we think that sort of abuse is unacceptable, Actually, probably the retailers are not liable at the moment. And is that OK? OK, thank you very much indeed for that. And just to acknowledge, um, Jane Bladen had actually uh, submitted a question on that very issue as whether a fair trade visual marker might, might be useful. So I hope we uh, have addressed it, uh, your question there, Jane. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to come on to, to a question now from Kate Roberts, who will be uh, known to very many of us uh, who uh, are uh, interested and follow um, the issues of, around uh, trafficking and slavery. Uh, Kate is asking, isn't providing security and certainty for people in the the NRM key to securing disclosure and confidence to give evidence. At present, people in the NRM have little or no certainty beyond the very short term and know they may soon be in a situation where they are again vulnerable to their traffickers. Now, Kate points to Lord McColl's Modern Slavery Victim Support Bill, uh, which she believes would go a long way to addressing these issues. How can we secure support for this bill. Um, now there's a lot in that question but I think we should go to the nub of it and this is the support for, for um, people who are in the NRM, NRM which uh, Christian mentioned earlier um, and I know um, actually Dame Sarah you have written to the Home Office even just questioning raising questions about basic financial support to those who are trying to navigate the NRM who are really struggling just to get payments uh, particularly during the pandemic. Um, Karen Bradley, do you think, do you think, you know, even this sort of base level for support of, of victims in the NRM is even remotely acceptable at this stage? Well, I think I said in my opening comments that the NRM needs uh, serious reform and the Home Office are looking at it. It's been promised so been, many times, hasn't it? Absolutely. We need to actually see this happen. We need to see some real change now because it's not acceptable that i mean the the backlog of cases apart from anything else is outrageous um the fact that children in particular find it so difficult to navigate the nrm the difference between uk nationals and overseas nationals and the way that they access support through the nrm means that in particular uk nationals are losing out on many bits of support that they should be entitled to as a victim of slavery. So there's an enormous piece of work to be done and, and I'm pleased the Home Office are looking at it, but this is now the opportunity to get it right because it comes back to the point that we've said time and again over this 
last 40 minutes, but before also. If you can't find the victim, support the victims, you can't then get the prosecution. You've got to tie the two things together. And what about uh, the, the future for Law McCall's uh, bill? I, I think it's not just about whether there needs to be one small bill that might change things this is about looking at this overall so at the moment i want to see this review happen and then understand what changes need to be made in legislation to get the nrm functioning but it isn't working at the moment christian can you uh, uh, add your observations onto that because the risk there which is highlighted by kate is that people fall out of the system they get desperate they're prone against again to uh, just to falling back into the hands of their traffickers i mean this is again it's sort of We've discussed this so many times, haven't we? No, yeah, I get bored of talking about it, really. Kate, Kate's right, um, uh, of course. Um, the, the problem is, in the Home Office now, this has become a, a, a problem. You know, the, the eyes will roll, the, the sickness will rise up in the stomach. Whenever they hear this story, their judicial reviews, it needs the Secretary of State to come in and have the guts, probably someone quite fresh, and I think Pretty could still do this, to, to, to say this is broken. It's not working and to, and to confront it because at the moment just sort of closing your eyes and wishing it's going to go away is the worst possible response get out there make an argument for why people including foreigners need support should be our priority should get the focus because if we don't organized crime groups will continue to run riot so it needs a home secretary to say yes i want to rebuild lives and provide care because it is morally right but also in this department, I care about keeping Britain safe and tackling crime. And if I care about that, it means we look after people who we find as victims of crime in our country, partly because it's right, but partly because I want to stop the traffickers who are out there laughing at the system we design. I mean, you, if you were a, tra a trafficker right now, you probably would design something a bit like we've got. And it's time, I'm getting sick of talking about it. It's time to do it. And it needs, it needs some political guts. And just very briefly, thank you, Kristen. Do you think, you know, is the, is the government resistant to this bill, um, Karen, in your view? Is that, is, that, is that what's sort of stopping it? Just very quickly. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's a, a private member's bill in the House of Lords, which doesn't really have any opportunity to get any further. And I think it's about the process and procedures of the House of Commons rather than anything else. But what I, you know, the important thing here is, as Christian said, grab this issue, make, you know, use this opportunity of the review to really reform the NRM, do what needs to be done to it, and then look at what legislation is needed to make that reform work. Julie, we'll have a we'll have a Queen, you know, so you have the Queen's speech every now and again, she pops in. You've got a comprehensive spending review. Set a bill out, get on with it. Very rarely do private members' bills change the country. I wish they would. You do get some, but if you had a home secretary that was running with it, and I think she can, I believe she cares, I think she can fight for this, but we're running out of time. Um, Dame Sarah, could I just bring you in just briefly on that point? So, oh my goodness, there's so much in Kate's question. Um, I think I pick out two things. Um, it's about the long-term support for victims and survivors. So for those who don't have a, a right to be in this country, there are the immigration issues which Lord McCall's bill deals with, and that's what Kate is hinting at. Um, what I'm concerned to see at the moment is, although people can uh, get discretionary leave, the numbers have been going down quite considerably over the last couple of years. So that's a cause of concern. But the second issue is for those even whose immigration status is certain. The uh, support uh, in terms of housing, in terms of health, in terms of work, in terms of education, still need uh, some really uh, close attention and much more help than is there at the moment. Okay, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. And just for those uh, who might not be familiar with the terminology, the NRM is the National Referral Mechanism by which we identify, formally identify uh, victims of trafficking and modern slavery uh, in this country. So I'm just going to have a look at through some more of these questions now, because I was really interested to see, um, actually, Dame Sarah, that you raised the issue of technical um, uh, uh, interventions being able to access uh, financial information uh, properly. And B. Carmarthen has been in touch to say seized computers and hard drives could be a source of evidence, especially if there's been exploitation online. But in my case, because I reported sometime after the crimes, they said they couldn't take the computer. It's difficult to get warrants and without them, it's hard to get evidence. Why is this? It's no wonder people don't want to report when it feels like action isn't taken. And I mean, if I just come back to you on this, Dame Sarah, if I may, because you raised it in your opening comments, um, what hurdles and obstacles to securing justice are there in terms of 
technical access to things like hard drives, things like financial information, and what progress have you been able to gauge? So there are a couple of particular issues in terms of the data, which might well reveal victims, reveal how traffickers are operating. The first is the whole issue of encryption. So even though you might have the hardware, you might have the telephones, actually, if the data is encrypted, then there's a real problem about law enforcement accessing it. Um, the second issue is even when you can access it, there is so much data on everybody's phones and everybody's hard drives. The ability to then to properly um, analyze it. And you know, there have been cases, mainly sexual offenses cases, where actually that hasn't been done properly. And then you really do risk a miscarriage of justice. So there are huge data issues. Um, and, uh, you know, again, they're not confined to the UK, they're, they're international. And in terms of financial investigation, um, I think there needs to be much more financial investigation of traffickers because as Caroline clearly said, this is largely a financial crime, but we don't often do that because financial investigators are in short supply uh, and the, the assets are not always um, found and therefore seized and therefore of course aren't able, uh, available for the courts then to give back to the victims in terms of reparations. So I think we need to do an awful lot more around financial investigation of the traffickers so that actually victims can get justice sometimes in terms of money and compensation. Okay, thank you for that. I'm just gonna carve through a couple of other questions because we've got so many coming in. Um, it's great to have so many people engaged on this um, for this opening session of the uh, CSJ conference. Um, Victoria Wilson has uh, sent a question. Immigration status can often be used as a mechanism for control. A lot has been said about the need for government and the Home Office leadership in tackling this issue. How do the Home Office square this with their hostile environment policy? And I suppose that goes slightly back, Karen, to that issue we were talking about, uh, about the language and the public's understanding of the distinction between trafficking and immigration offences. Um, there is a real difficulty, isn't there, around the rhetoric on immigration? Well, as a politician, you have to remember that you're speaking to a number of audiences at any one time. And, and I'm not therefore going to criticise what's been said by any politicians at the moment, but there is there has to be that clear distinction and we do need leadership to say that if you are a victim of trafficking you are a victim you are not somebody trying to commit the crime yourself you have been coerced into doing this now that's a really difficult nuanced argument and it probably doesn't sit very well on the Clapham omnibus or on the doorsteps if we can ever get back to knocking on doors again as politicians because it's complicated it's not a simple line it's not a headline that's going to be in the tabloid newspapers but it is important and it can be done it has been done before by politicians and it is done by many politicians around the world so i would just urge that we make sure we use that language incredibly carefully and we do try and bring the public with us because i think christian made the point the public want to support victims the public are um, fundamentally very compassionate and want to support victims and want to do the best for them but uh, one size fits all immigration systems and language that's perhaps used inappropriately make it more harder and harder for the public to understand that Okay, thank you. And um, we've got a question literally that picks up really well from that. Uh, Marta Pashkovska has been in touch to say uh, in 2011, uh, Marta sent a letter to Cheshire police offering free time as a translator. Um, she was hoping that it would help a few enslaved Polish um, uh, people that she was aware of, but she had never heard, heard a reply back from Cheshire police. Uh, I thought they must have had someone in my place. She writes, now after my experience with the police, I, I honestly believe my letter was just thrown in the bin. She says, how can we engage with police forces better? And Christian, can I come to you on that? And, and as a little sub question, I suppose, is that when we think of the pressure that our police forces are currently under in navigating the pandemic with modern slavery being a, a part of that picture, um, how do we make sure that somebody who's offering their services, engaging correctly as you would wish, um, finds an open door with police forces. And what has your experience been of that as an NGO? It's, um, well, first of all, we'll take you right, right to us because we're building yeah. a frank <laughs> right oh, so there you go. <laughs> if your Polish is still in track, let us know. Um, I think it's tough. It's one of those subjects that is quite difficult in the sense to to line up lots of volunteers for because it's not like a soup kitchen or a food bank or a befriending service where you're dealing with extremely 
vulnerable, sensitive, actually dangerous uh, people on the criminal side. So it has to be done carefully. But I do think there, again, this innovation that we need to try some things. We need to take take a few calculated risks, whether it's, you know, NGOs like ours have now got um, all sorts of opportunities to become drivers and translators and to put together emergency packages. So there are practical things people, people can do. The police, I, I think now, I would hope now that you'd get a different answer almost 10, 10 years on, because I think policing has really come such a long, a long way. And I think there's a general understanding that this is all hands on deck. You, know, you, you can't just tackle this problem with a team of investigators in, in a police station. You can't just do it as an NGO and you can't just do it as a volunteer. So I think there's a different spirit of partnership now, um, but it's not straightforward. I do have sympathy for police teams because they, they're dealing with things that are so complex and confidential, but we can still find a way. So please write to us and... Um, <laughs> oh, how lovely to be able to sort of do a bit of uh, good uh, matchmaking is probably the wrong word, isn't it, in this context, but um, <laughs> it's great to put people in touch. <laughs> um, and thank you very much indeed for that, Marta. Um, uh, let's go to a question now from Rory Brooks, because I think this is perhaps, you know, the, the, the context in which we have to set this, of course, and that is of the pandemic. And Rory has uh, sent a question in saying, uh, the pandemic is and will produce many more conventional victims through grief, disability, unemployment, to which the public and body politic may more easily respond. How does the anti-slavery and trafficking agenda sustain its voice? Um, and separately to that, the pandemic may see a proliferation of such activities, or I don't think any of us are in any doubt about that. I mean, this feels, in Rory's view, and to many of us, like a perfect storm. Um, Dame Sarah, your observations on that. I know we've spoken about this before, too. So um, I think part of the answer in terms of sustaining interest um, goes back to that point about um, political leadership um, and actually putting it really, really uh, strongly um, on the political agenda would make a huge amount of difference. But I also agree with the uh, questioner that what's happened um, during uh, lockdown is there was a real concern about domestic abuse, for example, and child abuse. And uh, when Number 10 had a hidden harm summit, I managed to, to get in there saying, you know, there's a real issue about uh, modern slavery and domestic servitude. And we managed to kind of be a, a small part in that. But you're absolutely right. There has been real concern in other sectors and actually keeping it on the forefront. It's partly my job, but, you know, we do need political leadership. We also need, um, you know, public figures, celebrities to talk about this and to speak up because I think that makes a huge influence. We need some Instagram influencers as well to be raising this concern uh, and saying that we should all take it more seriously because I do think that um, as the pandemic continues it does create new vulnerabilities. People who've lost their jobs um, for whom exploited the exploitative work might seem the best option for them in the circumstances in which they find themselves or indeed employers who've gone through really, really hard time might seek to cut corners. So I think we need to be absolutely on our guard um, as we go through this pandemic for the new vulnerabilities that it creates uh, in, in people. Um, Christian, when uh, you uh, issued uh, the, the report uh, a few weeks ago that, uh, that were, um, we spoke about before, um, you shone a very particular light on the new areas of vulnerabilities, the new areas of exploitation that this pandemic was uh, offering up as potential to criminals. Just give us a couple of little headlines on that, because even exploitation of furlough payments, for example, is something that had been flagged to you. Yeah, we did. We, we came across some of that um, industrial scale benefit fraud in, in cities. Um, you know, 70 people using the same phone number to register at Job Centre Plus. And um, we're seeing online platforms like this. Uh, we're hearing anecdotally, at least, that they're being used much more regularly than massage parlors and, and brothels you know we're seeing some of the violence in our casework spike because there's a lot of people who were being bussed in and out of places who are just now sat whether it's on in traveler sites or in other places so um the criminal networks are, obviously some of them are very amateur and some of them are very sophisticated obviously there's a real range but they're innovative and sophisticated and do adjust so they'll, they'll they're definitely using um lockdowns to change the way they try and make money and exactly you mentioned a few examples there um and also they work internationally and what what we're finding as victims we're supporting start mapping their journeys and experiences you know you're talking 10 15 countries sometimes through transit and and organized crime groups joining up as businesses do 
um, to work together and NGOs and governments are not good at that. We tend to stop in our stop at the border or stop in our town and city. So getting this right also has to mean we match up to the way they're matching up internationally in a pandemic or, or not. Uh, Karen, you're just nodding in agreement there. Would you like to come in on that point as well? Yeah, absolutely. A couple of points to make. First of all, um, we do really need to make sure that we don't finish at our border. And uh, I would say that we absolutely have to make sure that when we've left the transition period at the end of this year, we have access to those law enforcement instruments and tools that have been so important in tackling this global um, issue. And we, as the All Party Group, and looking next week um, at the role of uh, human traffickers in the channel ports, Dame Sarah's joining us for that, um, it's really important that we understand what traffickers are doing to get people to Calais, to Dunkirk and to Zeebrugge, to put them onto those containers to get them into the UK. We need to understand those networks and we need that global um, cooperation and leadership. I suppose the other point just to make is on consumers. Look, we're all tightening our belts. Things are tough and it's not going to get easier. But that's not an excuse to go for that sort of disposable fashion, disposable, cheap, uh, produce because as Dame Sarah said there will be a human being who's been exploited to get to this thing that is too good to be true and so it's this isn't a luxury that we can afford to just forget about because life is tough we've got to keep this at the forefront we need the press we need those influencers we need to be speaking about this we need to make sure people understand it and they do recognize the role they play in help in, in stopping fueling that organised criminality. Great, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I, as ever with these uh, events, I'm keeping a bit of an eye on the clock and we have actually covered a, a lot of material. I mean, everything uh, addressing the question, just to return to it, the topic was how we secure the justice for victims of modern slavery. Uh, indeed, after five years of having the Modern Slavery Act, um, it is still a pertinent and uh, crucial question given the conviction rates uh, being so low, sentencing being so low. There are clear questions which you've all raised about training of lawyers, better engagement between uh, the public and the police, uh, better profile of the issue, whether it's via politicians or the media, uh, better navigation for victims through uh, the national referral mechanism, mechanism, not just so that they get the humane and human support and compassion they deserve, but also to make sure they keep engaged with the uh, uh, legal process. And Dame Sarah raised some really important points too about making sure that we see this always as a global issue, uh, to understand how tech can be better used, how finance can be better understood, uh, to make sure that we can address the criminal network. So I think we've ranged over an enormous turf there as ever. Um, but uh, just to, as, as we close with our huge thanks to our panelists and all of the great questions, um, I've, I've managed to get through a few of them, but not all, of course. Um, if I could just have a closing thought from each of you really about the urgency of this moment. Um, we're not staring uh, in the headlights of this pandemic now. We are absorbing what it means for all of our lives and all of the big social issues which were already there before this trauma hit. So in one, two sentences, please tell me why we need to seize this moment in terms of securing justice for the victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. And uh, Dame Sarah, I'll come to you first. I'll lob that one your way. During the pandemic, I think we have seen tremendous increases in neighbourliness and kindness and lots of positive things in the human spirit. It's a great opportunity to think about actually, well, what does that mean for those of our fellow uh, citizens in this country, but actually in, in the whole of the world about their exploitation? And let's extend our kindness to people who maybe we don't see, but who really, really do need it. Thank you very much. Karen. Well, I suppose it's very short, really. If we, if we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? Um, we can't avoid this issue. We can't pretend it's not there. It's happening. It's happening in our streets, in our towns, in our villages, in our cities. And if we don't, if we don't grasp this moment, then what, when are we going to grasp it? Thank you. And Christian? Yeah, we've got to decide. We don't want our 
grandchildren, great grandchildren to inherit it, and, or at least to be able to say to them that we did what we could to fight it. Um, it's the right thing to do. It will make our country safer. And uh, I want to look them in the eye when I'm grey and old and say we gave everything to try and make life better for what they've inherited. So there's no better time than now. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you uh, uh, to Caroline in her absence because she's shot off to do, <laughs> to do the day job uh, for her contributions earlier too. So uh, Christian, uh, Karen and Dame Sarah, thank you uh, all three and Caroline too for taking part. Um, I do hope for those of you who've joined us on the webinar that there are uh, areas where perhaps you can engage further on this, push some of the elements that all of our contributors have uh, uh, presented us with this morning and uh, most of all galvanise all of us who uh, feel so strongly about this issue to find new ways of keeping it on the agenda, working more effectively and moreover on the most basic compassionate human level finding support for those who've suffered this appalling crime and help them navigate their way to a better life and justice. So thank you very much indeed uh, to all of you for joining us today. Thank you for the CSJ for hosting this and I wish uh, the CSJ all the best with the rest of their discussions to come. Thank you. <laughs>